at this point, I would like to introduce Andrew Conway to the stage from Microsoft. And we're going to have a quick fireside chat without a fire, which we're getting pretty good at here in uh, lovely Arizona. Please. Thanks, Marvel. Uh, here's a water in case you actually need one. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. OK. So I, I guess why don't we start with you telling people what you do. So Microsoft's a big organization. Which group are you in? <laughs> uh, so I'm part of the cloud and enterprise team, so the team that works on Azure. And my team's responsible for all of the product marketing for our services for enterprise mobility. OK. So we just had a panel up here for uh, Android for Work. And I was going to start with asking you, is EMM dead? But apparently, it's all about app config now. So what's your, uh, what's your perspective on what's going on in the enterprise mobile management space? Are there things people should be looking for? Is it a rapidly evolving space? Or have we kind of hit sort of a nice status quo? Yeah, I don't think we've hit a status quo. I mean, I thought it was interesting, one of the first panels on yesterday with the gentleman from Air Canada talking about the fact that you have to reevaluate things every six months. Uh, so EMM is certainly not dead. I mean, what we're seeing is that it's expanding in new and different and interesting ways. And the very concept of EMM is growing. So it's bringing in things now like security and mobile security. It's bringing in identity and access management. It's bringing in what may have been called in the past data leakage prevention or data loss prevention, encryption. So there's a whole new raft of technologies that are really converging in the space. Yeah, that actually brings up an interesting point. So yesterday I was talking about this concept of contextual security where we move from devices to thinking about apps to thinking about um, identity and context. Um, how are you seeing that whole space evolve? Is that an area that you're spending a lot of time on? I know we had some discussions at RSA about this, but what are you thinking about the whole contextual security market? Is that a here, a now, or a future? No, it's definitely here. I mean, we're seeing customers today uh, using the cloud now for access control, using the cloud for single sign-on, uh, not just for SaaS applications, actually, or cloud applications, but back to their on-premises applications. And so I think earlier there was a conversation around, is identity the new perimeter? Actually, the way that we look at it is that identity is, in fact, the control plane. If you think about the fact that applications are going to the cloud and devices are in increasingly just connected to the uh, public internet, there's no traffic traversing your network. And so a lot of the traditional uh, security techniques are becoming less useful. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't still do them, and there's still a hygiene level of things that you need to do. But as apps move to the cloud, devices are cloud connected. Using the cloud and cloud identity as this control plane turns out to be uh, super useful. So that's, that's the first thing, and that's more of a platform statement. I think wound into that more from a security point of view is that we're seeing that customers are not just then using it for protection, and spending time investing in biometrics or investing in multi-factor auth to get past uh, the issue with passwords. But they're also now investing more and more in detection. And so when we think about uh, contextual, we think about detecting behavior that's happening with your users around the world, no matter what they're doing and with what app. So we can tell if someone's logging in in Singapore against a cloud app, and then two minutes later they're logging in in, say, Paris, clearly something's going on. Or we can take data from our digital crimes unit and look at IP addresses that have been used as part of a botnet recently. We can match that with um, access into your tenant on the cloud. And we can say, OK, someone seems to be coming in from an IP address that looks like a botnet. And so we can take contextual information across millions of different uh, tenants in the directory and across hundreds of millions of different users and combine that together and give you intelligence back. So I think this idea of context, this idea of big data, this idea of uh, machine learning all comes together to help security in, in this sort of challenging time. Does it have to all come together in the cloud? Or is there an opportunity to do this closer to prem for those people that are interested in that? Yeah, I think it's both. I mean, when you set up something in the cloud, you've got some connection back to on-premises. There's some hybrid uh, aspects to it. You've probably got uh, a directory on-premises that you're syncing with the cloud, or you're doing federation, or, or, or whatever you're doing. But it, it's clearly across both. In fact, uh, when we started on this path with Azure, for instance, and the, the directory in Azure, Azure Active Directory, 
the number one question we got from our customers around the security reporting that we were doing was, please, can we have this on-premise? And so we actually found a small company in uh, Israel about 18 months ago called Aerato, and we, which is the Greek word for invisible, I found out, because I have a Greek person um, on my team. So he's always educating me on the origins of language and things like that. He's very proud to be from Greece. Uh, so I found out that Aerato was Paul, about... you'd be proud too, right? <laughs> <laughs> was, uh, he, uh, Aerato was being about invisible, but what Aerato was doing, and that's now become advanced threat analytics, is they were using the same techniques against on-premises directory. And so they were looking at all of the activity that was going in and out of your on-premises directory and building effectively a graph of that activity and then giving you insights from that um, activity. So it's, it's, it's exactly that. There's things in the cloud, but people also want things in premise. And, so, and of course, the two things are connected, right? You have data sets in, in both places. So um, two things. One, I'm going to open it up for questions in a minute. Two, I'm allowing him a chance to drink. And three, I'm going to ask a question now. So uh, you started talking about various different styles of identity. We heard multi-factor authentication. We heard threat detection. We heard um, Azure Active Directory. I mean, how do people think about identity right now? You know, we heard about CASBs yesterday. Um, do they need all of it? Is there a certain set of strategies people need to think about? What, what's the what's the cadence of how people decide what they need? Yeah, that's a uh, that's a vast question. So maybe maybe I'll start uh, with like the beginnings of sort of moving to the cloud and thinking about identity. Um, it starts normally with companies adopting their first uh, software as a service application, and so they have some reason to uh, have identity in the cloud. Have passwords in the cloud or to set up a federation relationship. And I think if you've only got one, um, then it feels manageable. Right. But then when you get two, three, four, 20, it starts to feel like it's, it's not manageable. And so that's when this idea of using identity as a control plane or a hub, if you will, in the cloud that you connect to your on-premise, um, just doing that and just adding applications to that hub and getting single sign-on is useful because then you get out of this mode where you've got lots of uh, employee credentials, maybe with the same passwords, all yes. in all of these different services, and you actually don't know what data is associated with those. Um, so I think I think that's a first step. You also mentioned um, CASB or Cloud Access Security Broker, and for us that's sort of a, a step on from that basic step, which is saying mo most CASBs have a discovery aspect to what they do. And so one of the first things that companies do, and I think this came up in the presentation yesterday from Sean Bass, is they run a cloud app discovery tool and they figure out that they're using or their employees are using way more SaaS than they actually think they are, right? Because you, exactly, because you have this sort of viral growth of SaaS. And many of the SaaS companies today are not betting on IT to deploy them, right? Because that would be way too slow. They're not even betting now on a department or a business owner to deploy them. They're betting on everyone in this room just to deploy them in a viral way as an employee. So where CASB comes in or Cloud App Discovery is actually gives you uh, visibility into all the applications that are being used. And then when you see applications and you want to keep using them, then you can bring them under control with that Cloud App Access Security Broker. And it turns out that many... Uh, SaaS vendors today, Office 365 in our case included, are exposing a lot of data through APIs. So any partner, because security requires you know, vast partnerships across the industry, any partner can come in, consume that data, that contextual data, and then start to build you a map of really what's happening in your SaaS application. So for instance, you can look at data inflows and outflows from Box. You can look at, say, the finance, users in the finance department and, and, and see the number of public documents that they have in, say, Box or OneDrive for Business and say, okay, why does the finance department need public documents? So you, so you get all this sort of data coming back from a CASB that's, that's interesting, that's contextual and allows you to, uh, you know, you can set policy against it and, and ultimately become more secure. Are those, we, we talked about unified endpoint management a little earlier. I mean, are we starting to see these things actually converge, or are they still ending up in separate places where we've got PC management, mobile management? I guess we're going to have IoT management is another thing that we're talking about. How are you seeing that evolving in organizations? It is, uh, in terms of the different spaces, they are converging. I think if you, if you talk to analysts, there tends to be a bias towards 
viewing each technology sort of technology by technology by technology, mm -hmm. and they're often speaking to technologists, and so it, it might feel a little bit more fragmented than it really is, but it's on a, it's on a path of convergence, I think. Um, inside companies, it it's obviously depends on the company, and what, what we see is you know, where you've got larger companies with specialist roles, you're still going to need to deliver services for each of those roles to make those individuals successful. So for instance, we do many things today just in our core identity and access management tooling um, in Azure that's primarily targeted at the identity admin. But then we have security products now that are, that are part of the offering that are targeted at the security admin, who's a, a different role maybe in the office of the CISO. And so they may be procuring products just for themselves. And so I think inside a company, even as spaces converge, there's always going to be individuals involved in different activities to help the organization, and they're going to have different needs and, and you know, different goals in life. Excellent. Are there any questions in the audience? I can't see very well. Are there any questions? Yep, I got uh, one. George has George. a question. So Eric and I were having a little mini sidebar here. Did, did we hear you correctly? You, were you in, inferring, now he's claiming innocence. <laughs> were you inferring that Azure basically is providing managed security services as a part of the implementation? Managed security services? Yeah. So Azure, Azure today has security that's just built into the platform, right? We're operating data centers. We're you know, running data centers in different geographies. We're running government data centers in some case, cases. We're running data centers in, uh, in China. So the way we think about security is kind of a layered thing. There's certain things that, that are just part of the platform. And then there are services that run on top of the platform that offer additional security benefits. For instance, today we offer something called Azure Security Center. So what that does is it gives you a, a view across all of the assets that you're running in Azure gives you insight into configurations, things like that. So that's a separate service that runs on top of Azure, but it's not in the core guts of the platform that just keeps the, the, the platform secure. OK, thanks. Does that help? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Is there another question? Oh, yep, I'm, I'm a coming. I get my exercise. I think that's Tim. No, no. Mel. no. You were talking about CASB being important for your Azure um, services. A lot of us are moving to Office 365. And for us, you know, it's always the concern of using a public cloud for a very you know, private organization who really wants to keep things locked down and you know, we're very risk adverse. You, know, you hear that over and over again. But would, how would we implement a, a, that security broker between a company like ours and you know Azure or any of the other services. Yeah, um, it's a it's a good question. Uh, I, I'm not recommending that a, that a CASB is right for every situation and for every company. Um, I think there's a degree of sophistication around security that's that's necessary probably to want to go with a with a CASB solution. And also there are trade offs in terms of uh, in terms of user experience. In terms of going to the public cloud, though, and the security of the public cloud, um, you know, related to the question that I was answering earlier, if you think about um, the learning or experience curve that a company travels down as they build out a public cloud, it, it's quite the investment on so many different levels, right? Billions of dollars, building out data centers, and achieving certifications and standards and a level of trust and privacy uh, that's built into that platform. And so if I was in your situation in a company and I was evaluating, do I go to the cloud? If I do go to the cloud, which public cloud provider do I pick? Do I pick Azure? Do I pick AWS? Do I pick Google? I would encourage you all to go take a look at the uh, documentation that that vendor has on their website around trust, privacy, security. If they're accredited with certain uh, certifications like ISO, uh, if they meet operational standards for uh, protecting data, for locating data inside different geographies, those are the sorts of things that customers are interested in. And pretty much all cloud providers publish those on the website. So I'd absolutely recommend going to what, what we would call the Azure Trust Center, which is a place where we keep all of that information. And that's really what you should dig into. 
Any other questions, Phil? Did you see any other? Okay. Um, we haven't spent much time talking about IoT. Yes. Yeah. That one of the things that when you're thinking about cloud and IoT, it seems like there's a lot going on in the platforms. I know Rob Tiffany's here. He's uh, been yeah. talking about uh, uh, cloud and IoT. Um, what should people be thinking about in that regard? Um, I think it's it's back to the uh, one of the earlier panels actually, which is rather than saying sort of how do I go I IoT, it's so closely aligned with uh, business, with business process, and really how you're going to make money. Right, so it's about understanding like what really is the data that's going to let you differentiate uh, versus a competitor. That's going to give you a different level of agility, a different level of customer insight, and then how can you bring that uh, to your business? And then on the back end, how are you going to select a set of services uh, from a cloud provider who has the chops to really bring um, that level of compute power insight? Uh, machine learning against your data set to allow you to, to move forward. Okay, so you've talked a lot about advice. I guess um, I'd probably like to close with a question around what excites you about mobile cloud right now in the space and, and what do you think we'll be talking about next year? Yeah, it's super exciting space. I mean, I've, I've been doing this for four years and we're a couple of years now in on the enterprise mobility suite. What excites me the most is it's still very much uh, a set of solutions in transition. I think even in the medium term, uh, no one has yet fully figured out um, like what will work ultimately. And that, that may sound a little you know, distressing or disturbing, it's not meant to be, but it's, it's a space that's evolving um, so quickly. And so what we may have seen maybe one, two years ago in the context of EMM around sort of traditional MDM vendors who were reliant on connecting back to on-premise is, al is already changing. How we think about cloud is, is already changing. A few years ago, if I went to an event in Germany and tried to present on Microsoft Intune, for instance, they literally wouldn't let me. It's not that they would like humor me for a little while or let me talk. They would literally say, no, please stop. And, and clearly, things have, you know, things have changed. Things have moved on. So for me, it's, it's the pace and it's the fact that um, it's still not figured out. Right? I'm just naturally a super curious person. And so I'm just super curious how this turns out. So are we all going to be talking about machine learning and cognitive services next year, or do you think there's something in between? I don't know that there's anything in between. I think that, I mean, that, that, I think the, the power of having a, and if, if you want to call this cognitive services, machine learning, the power of having a vast data set and the ability to reason over that is, is just, you know, in incredible. So I think that's probably going to keep you busy for a number of these M6 events, yes. not just next year, but I think onwards into the medium term. Yeah. Excellent. Well, with that, are you going to be at Cocktail Hour this evening? I am not, unfortunately, no. I'm <gasps> heading back to uh, Seattle later All today. All right. Well, if you want to talk to Andrew, grab me now. Grab him on the way <laughs> to your case study.